Welcome, my name is Ginny. I work for a company called The Ivy Way. I run a company called The Ivy Way. And it is great to be joining you over your lunchtime. I assume in the lunch and learn that everyone has really lavish lunches in front of them. I don't know if that's actually the case, <laughs> but I wondered if anyone has something particularly exciting that they, uh, they wanted to brag about, you're welcome to share it in the chat. It'd be nice to see what, what people have been munching on. And uh, for those of you that have got your cameras on, we might even be able to spot what you're munching on there. Some crisps, very good, Ola. I've just had some reheated risotto, so not a bad lunch for a Tuesday, but it is really nice to, to have all of you guys join us. And if you are just joining now, if your audio is just connecting, then we were saying that it'd be really nice to see some people's faces. So if you were able to turn your camera on, I know some people are, um, are on walks or various other things, but if you can, it'd be so nice to see. Thanks, James. Lovely to see you. Thanks, Ronan. Um, it's much nicer speaking to a sea, of, a sea of faces rather than to blank screen. So if you can, then that would be absolutely wonderful. So this session today is about giving you some tools, equipping you to be able to navigate conflict, conflict well. And you might have joined for various reasons. Maybe this is a topic you're really interested in. Maybe when you hear the word conflict, there's there's something about that that makes you want to learn a bit more or you're kind of intrigued in, by some means. But just before we dive in and to give you a little bit of background to who I am, what I do, uh, I work with a mix of corporate companies and startups. So some of the big, big tech companies like Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, and also in the startup scene across various accelerator programs. So with, uh, with Republic of Works Friends, Dog Patch Labs in Dublin, and then with Google for Startups, Techstars, all, all the kind of accelerator programs that, that you might have heard of. Uh, and I essentially work with people to help them work out how they can communicate better. What are some of the habits or techniques that get in the way of them being able to communicate themselves well? And as you all know, there are various things within the idea that the, um, the field of conflict, which stop us being able to communicate well. So first of all, I'd love to hear, and I know the chat's kicking off already, so I'm keep, keeping an eye on it for you. Um, what, what's brought you to this session today? What in particular you might be wanting to get out of a discussion or a workshop around conflict? So if there's something particular which springs to mind, it'd be really helpful to hear from, from my end so I know how to give you the, the best, the most useful tools throughout this session. So if there are some things in particular, then uh, it'd be great to hear from you in the chat box or you're, you're welcome to unmute yourself as well. So the question is, what, what brought you to the session today or what is it you are looking to get out from this workshop, this time that we've got together? So if you've got yeah. some particulars. Terence, you look like you're about to speak, go for it. Yeah, um, I'd like to find out about the conflicts and how you resolve conflicts in the workplace and I try to get some facts out of it. Great. So quite specifically in the workplace then and getting some facts to help with that. Yeah. Lovely. How about for other people? Um, Elena's just sent into the chat box to say she has an interest in all aspects of communications. Mm. And Aurelien said she's interested in communication and the giraffe language. Mm. And so Sylvia has said she wants to manage to be assertive but not aggressive. Mm, lovely, some great things in the chat. Yeah, as we said at the beginning, feel free to use the, the chat function as well. Um, I love that phrasing, being assertive but not aggressive. I think that's probably something that people almost uh, exposes a bit of a fear that sometimes we have of when we're in conflict coming across in a way where we can really say what we think but without inflaming the conversation and things getting worse. So my next question for you guys, oh, it's another one that's just come up from Elizabeth. Conflict management, um, important in the world of remote working. Yes, absolutely. What you might realize, which you, you would have realized across the last year is we see this much of each other. I see from the top of your head down to your chest bone. There's not a, there's not a lot that you can pick up or there's definitely a lot less that you can pick up when you're speaking to one another in this format as you would be when you were physically in, in front of people. There's lots of things about virtual communication that get in the way of really clear, effective communication. And I think there's been some, some additions in the chat as well around the idea of assertiveness. Oh, Orla, you've got a great suggestion here. So I'm just going to read that out as well. So working with strong personalities where there's some clashes and communicating without escalating the situations. Great. And if there's anything else that comes to mind, feel free to drop it in the chat. I'll, I will try and answer any questions that you have as well, but I'll, I'll also make some time to do that at the end. 
All right, I wanted to do a quick exercise with you guys, if that's okay. I've heard you guys are pretty up for doing things for kind of it being a bit interactive. So this is this is really not anything weird or too too wacky. So don't don't worry. Um, but it's just just to kind of get you thinking a bit about the, the communication that's needed in uh, in conflict. So it's it's a really quick game, and all it is is counting to twenty. Okay. So the idea is that one person will start and say the number one. So Orla, you're going to be my number one because you're sort of in the center of my screen so I can see you really easily. You're going to be my number one and then somebody else will jump in and say the number two. And then somebody else, doesn't matter who, will jump in and say the number three and so on and so forth. And the idea is to try and get to the highest number possible. But when two people say the same number at the same time, then we reset back to one again. So relatively simple concept maybe something you played even as a child so not too hard to get but all it will always say number one you're also welcome to join in with other numbers as well but and then somebody random doesn't matter who will take on the number two three four etc don't uh, don't try and work out an order it's, it will probably change each time i know some groups i do this with try and try and uh, chat have like a secret conversation in the chat about what the order is so that's that's called cheating so you're not allowed to do that but uh, do you want to have a go at this let's see how it goes all right, if you've got food in your mouth, then <laughs> don't worry, you can finish chewing for a second. Orla, why don't you take it away for us as our number one then? One. Two. Three. three. Oh. oh, I think there was two people on number Sorry, three. Sorry, one. <laughs> two. two. Oh, I think two people were on number two again, so we'll start again. One. One. All is always number one. So if you're jumping in on number one as well, keep it quiet for a moment. All is number one, and then you can jump in after that. Okay, one. Two. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Ooh, okay, we got high there. I think two people said the number seven, so we'll start again. One. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. eight. Oh. <laughs> that was good though. Let's try one more time. One, two, three, four, five, five. Oh, was that two people on number five? I wasn't paying close oh. attention. Let's try it one final time. One final time. Okay, one. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Seven. Eight. Nine. Oh, okay, let's wrap it up there for now. Nine is a pretty good number. It's pretty hard to get above seven. When there's more than about 15 people, this is near to impossible to do. But I, I hope what you saw, even if you didn't realize it very consciously in the moment, is a lot of people actually lean towards the screen slightly. So whether you've got your camera on or not, what you might have realized is you're, there's kind of this anticipation as you're watching to see if somebody's about to say the next number, whether you should jump in, what you should do. And I think it's really interesting re reflecting on that or comparing that to how we sometimes feel in conflict. Because I don't, for myself personally, maybe you'll recognize yourself in this as well. I don't sit on the edge of my seat waiting to hear what somebody else is gonna say when it comes to conflict. We often hear our own voice, our own uh, arguments, our own frustrations really powerful, powerfully, very loudly in our own head, that it's actually quite hard to listen to the other person and take in what their frustration is, how they might have felt hurt, what, what, what's going on on their end. Uh, so I think it's a great starting point to think of what stops us from doing that and how might, might we be able to lean slightly further towards other people when we're in those tricky conversations when our, our default, our instinct is probably to push back, to defend, maybe even to attack back when we feel slightly attacked in conflict. 
So let's jump into, into some stuff then. Um, I want to know from you guys what your immediate reaction is when you hear the word conflict, whether it is um, nerves, whether, whether it's kind of quite neutral, not too bothered either way, or whether it's um, actually you feel quite pumped up or quite excited by conflict. And there might also be a, a, fourth, a fourth option I haven't given you so far. So give me, give me some sense of like the words that you feel when yeah, the, the idea of conflict comes up or you know you're gonna have quite a tricky conversation. So in the chat box there we have tension, anxiety, quite neutral, more anxiety. Someone else said they don't like conflict, no clarity. Mm -hmm not in my stomach. Mm, interesting. So it's this mix of some of the emotion, emotive language. And actually what we, what's coming through here from Jessica and Aure, um, Aureline as well is some of the physical responses you have. So a knot in your stomach or your breathing being slightly distorted. Um, like something, a pain as well. Wow, okay, that's quite a strong word and disruption. So there's some really interesting phrases that are coming through there. And as I said, I want to try and give you some technique which just um, enables you to try and, and have a sense of control as you move through conflict and try and manage, because these are strong emotions, right? And we're going to look a little bit as to why, why these happen, what's going on inside your brain, which leads you to feeling really overwhelmed, maybe even physically responding to what's happening. So I'm just going to share some, some slides with you um, in a second. So let me just get those up for you. Um, give me one second while it's loading. Cool. And hopefully you should be able to see in a second. Oops. Give me a thumbs up if you can see this. That's perfect, Jenny. Lovely. Thanks, guys. It's always helpful to know. All right. Um, so there's, there's, as somebody mentioned earlier on, there's a lot of challenges in, in video, video calls that play into this as well. So you have, if you're, if you're in a, a tricky conversation with a team of people, so if you're in a, a meeting where there's something that's come up, it's a bit of a heated discussion. Uh, one of the things that happens, which wouldn't happen if you were physically in the same space, is you're looking, you have this real tunnel vision in terms of your eye contact, where you're looking, being in one place on your screen, or one, one, you know, one, uh, just ratio of, of space but often your your brain is being challenged to try and pick up and decode lots of different people's behavior all at once so in, in times gone by uh, back when we were all physically together if somebody was about to say something you would hear them breathe and so you would know to, to hold what you were saying and let them do so but as we've just seen with that one to 20 exercise it's really easy to speak on top of each other and for, for conversations to get quite um, quite messy and for the information to get lost within that as well and some of the body language that we used to pick up on you could tell if somebody was frustrated because maybe they had their arms crossed in front of their body or you might have even been able to sense their breathing getting slightly heavier or, or seeming like they're slightly short of breath or whatever it might be that's also really hard to pick up over video calls because sometimes people are on mute until they speak so you don't really get a sense of some of those behaviors that informed how we were to respond. And it's worth saying now, conflict isn't always that kind of really dramatic, absolutely fiery conversation that happens. It's, the, it's defined as a struggle or a disagreement between two or more people. And that could be something quite small. There's, if you think back to your last week, whether that's in a work context or um, at your, in your home, your family life, there are lots of small frustrations or struggles that you have and a lot of them pass you by but some of them really get to you and you might respond to those in particular because of how that's um, that's made you feel or how um or what that's done to you and there's a great definition of conflict this is by somebody called nate reagan who's written some brilliant books on conflict and he says that conflict exists when there's a gap between what we expect and what we experience so an example of this might be, it's totally hypothetical, I'm sure this has never happened to any of you, never happened to me. You might expect at home, uh, your partner to unload the dishwasher. Totally expect my husband will unload the dishwasher. And when I, what happens, what I experience is that doesn't always happen. So there's that gap that in between the two. And yes, that's a really trivial example. And there's, there's many others you might be able to think of where there's actually something a bit, the stakes are a bit higher and there's more to play it. James, thank you, it's definitely a classic one. Um, but there's, 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 there's that gap that exists when 
what we would like to happen and what has actually happened isn't quite the same and that causes a real frustration. So just take a second and have a think for me about something in the last week, maybe in the last couple, which if you look back, you can see that what actually happened, what frustrated you and what you expected to happen or would have liked to happen were quite different. And the reason I want you to think about this is in a conflict situation when we're trying to navigate a really tricky conversation, we're normally very good at communicating what we all actually happened. You didn't unload the dishwasher or you emailed me way too late in the day for me to see that. Or, you know, you're always late to meetings. You're really late to this meeting today. And what we don't always acknowledge or are able to articulate as well is what we expected, what we would have liked to have happened. So just take a second to think, you don't have to write it in the chat, but just, just for yourself of a, a moment in the last couple of weeks where you experienced this, what happened and what you would have liked to have happened were quite different. And later on, I'm gonna show you a framework where you can articulate that really well. This, this difference between the two, the gap between the two, which sometimes comes through in more explosive language, but there is a way to navigate that uh, in a slightly better way. So as you'll know, there are lots of different responses to conflict. Some of you have uh, identified them already when I got you to talk about the different emotions that you feel. But there's also the, 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 four, key, the four key responses that we have to conflict are fight, flight, freeze, or roll over. It's quite hard to say actually, there's a lot of Fs in that. So the fight one, this is the classic, I think somebody actually did say they feel um, not excited by, by conflict, but sort of ready to go. So if you think about your natural response to conflict, some people are actually quite ready. They get the adrenaline kicks in and what they feel is, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go into battle. I know what I'm gonna say, I'm feeling pretty pumped. This doesn't mean this is always a, a good version of fight. Sometimes somebody might go in all guns blazing and it looks really messy and goes completely wrong, but fight might be one of your, one of your instincts. The flight is where at the sniff of conflict, you just wanna get out of there. As soon as you sense that something could get tricky, you tend to try and leave the room, leave the conversation, whatever it might be. Freeze is where you actually might stay and try and have that conversation, but all of your thoughts feel like they have disappeared from your mind. And when you try and string together a sentence, you think or you hope that it's gonna be really, really coherent but actually it comes out in a bit of a jumble or you really don't know what to say. And then finally roll over is, uh, as, as you might think of um, uh, a puppy or a dog as they roll over, it's that real submission or compromise position of, okay, you win, I'm just gonna let you do your thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of push this onto you and, and let, you, let you have your way. So again, maybe in the chat function, it'd be helpful just to hear what some people's responses are, what, what you feel you might naturally go towards it's worth saying as you think about this, that depending on the relationship you have with somebody might also determine how you respond. So with people you're closest to, spouses, families, partners, whoever it might be, um, we are, with some of us are actually a bit better at the fight, as in not better, but it, see, it feels a bit easier to really have it out and have that conversation. And with people um, who you work with, who you might not know as well as, and are trying to tread more carefully around you might more go for the flight, freeze or rollover, depending. So if, you, if one of those springs to mind, if you can think of what your natural response is, it'd be really interesting to, to hear. So you can jot, just jot in the chat again, A, B, C or D, depending on where you feel you sit within those. Give me a sense of where people are at, at or up to. Some A's, some, okay, a couple of A's so far and a B. Yeah, C. I'm... I think I've learned to try and move towards conflict, but if I'm honest, um, when, I'm, when I'm really not feeling it, I definitely go for freeze and, and find it very hard to put together, put my thoughts together of what I wanna, what I wanna say. Uh, yeah, all of this is interesting. Sometimes I react differently with all of these depending on the situation. I think that's very true, but mostly B or C. <laughs> James, great, like to fight and resolve as quick as possible with family. <laughs> I think there's something good in that, right? There's there's certain relationships which, because um, we value them, because they're worth something, we actually want to resolve them. We want to move move quicker. And you're right, actually, there are certain situations where it, it can be quite awkward. I always feel sorry for people who work in call centres who are taking complaints because we don't know the person; they're a kind of stranger. So we sometimes 
find it a bit easier to go into that fight mode to let them know what our complaint is about our dishwasher breaking down or whatever because we can't see them and it's sometimes easier to really to really say what we think or feel when, when we're not met with the face of a person so what's actually happening inside your brain when this happens so all of you have a part of your brain which is called the amygdala and um, this is a, a, a great part of your brain in many ways, but what psychologists note happens in conflict, they call an amygdala hijack. So the amygdala is um, quite a temperamental part of your brain. It's part of the limbic system. So that's often otherwise called the lizard brain. So quite a, a very old um, primitive structure that back in the times where we were living in caves, where we needed to be able to fight, to physically fight really quickly, this would fire into action. This would detect threat and be able to, um, to give you what you needed to kind of tool up to be able to deal with what is in front of you. But the problem with this, with the fact that our amygdala, this part of our brain fires up and kicks into gear, is that um, society's evolved quicker than this part of our brain in some, in some ways. So, uh, and our brain responds in the same way as if a, a tiger were to walk into your room right now. I don't know why I chose that, that's super strange. If a tiger were to walk into your room right now, your amygdala would fire up in the same way that you often feel or often happens when you're met with a conversation which is really tricky and really challenging. A similar thing happens in your brain, it fires up in the same way. And so our brain isn't always good at detecting what's physical threat, and what's emotional threat. It just, just happens in the same way. And um, it's a great, a great conflict researcher called Kwame Christian who sums this up perfectly. He says that uh, what ends up happening is that we fight modern battles. We have these really tricky conversations, but we're actually using really prehistoric tools. This part of our brain, which is actually um, slightly outdated in some ways in terms of how it enables us to fight well or to have those conversations well. So how do we move from this? Because this sounds like quite bad news. We've got this brilliant part of our brain, but it fires up and it actually often makes us respond quite emotionally, feel quite overwhelmed, and some of those physical responses that you mentioned earlier on. And the good news is that there is a way of us using the prefrontal cortex, a different part of our brain, which actually is a little bit more rational. It helps us process information, helps us find a way forward or set goals. And there's a way of us using that and trying to access that part of the brain when we're in conflict, which gives us a much better chance of getting somewhere. And that's what I wanna spend the next, the next 20 minutes looking at with you is, how do you start to use that? How can you try and engage that part of the brain when sometimes it really feels like you are just overwhelmed with, uh, with emotion. And the other thing to note is that when, you are, when your amygdala gets fired up, it's actually quite hard to be creative. So if you think about it, if, you, um, if your child slips and falls and they cut their leg open, what your, what your brain is doing, it sees a threat, sees what's happened, and you just grab whatever you can around you to try and stop the bleeding. Your brain isn't brainstorming really carefully all the different options of what could we do right now? What could happen? You jump into action. And, um, and I think that's helpful in thinking about conflict in, in some ways of we, almost all of us, in fact, I'm gonna say it, all of us have had conversations where we have said something that we regret, where something tumbles out of our mouth. And before we've even thought it through or really thought, okay, what impact could this have? The words have landed and it's happened and it's really hard to repair. And I know I'm talking about this a lot in the context of speaking. And this also happens quite a lot over email. You might have hit send, fired off an email, hit send, and then moments later thought, oh my gosh, what on earth have I done there? Can I just get like a raise of hand if you've ever done that? I've definitely done that and I'm hoping I'm not alone. <laughs> Thanks, Ronan. And it's very, very hard in that moment to think, gosh, I, I really wish I'd slowed down. So this is, this is one tool to, to get you thinking about how you can enter a challenging conversation in a slightly different way. So I'll just talk you through what this quadrant here represents. So there's, there's different ways of approaching conflict. And actually, depending on the situation, sometimes uh, what we might deem as a poor way of approaching conflict can be quite helpful. So on the, uh, the quadrant, the horizontal line going across, you've got low concern for goals or high concern for goals. 
So, um, and on the, the other axis, on the vertical line, we've got high concern for relationship or low concern for relationship. So I'll just talk you through each of these. So in that, that top left quadrant, you'll see a number one there. So this is where you, um, uh, you might not, um, you might have a high concern for the relationship. So it might be somebody who uh, you really care about, a friend who maybe feels offended or you offended. And actually you have quite a low concern for the goal. So the goal represents um, getting to the end of the conversation, really figuring it out, battling for how do you find a way forward? So what you might do in that situation is, is just kind of yield. It's that rollover thing of let's just do this your way. I don't care enough about winning that I'm going to fight for this. My concern for our relationship is too high. And sometimes that's not a bad thing, especially if it's a very minor dispute and it's not worth having it out. But sometimes you're actually compromising what you would like, how you feel, what would you, you would like to come of the situation. So with all of these, it's worth weighing up where, where is appropriate to use that and where is not. And number two is, is a real avoidance. It's where you don't really care about the relationship and you don't really care about figuring it out either. So with a stranger, if you, if you accidentally bump into a stranger or they bump into you, you don't really care about them. You might not really care about actually addressing it with them. You might let it go, you might walk away. But if it's actually a relationship or if it's um, something that is, uh, is worth looking into, if somebody has offended you and you would actually like to have that conversation, you probably wouldn't wanna sit in this axis because you won't get anything done. And there's not much care for the relationship there and how to move through in a sensitive way to honor that either. Number three, so that's in the bottom right quadrant there is where you have a really high concern for goals but don't really care about maintaining the relationship. So this might be where you see quite an aggressive response. Somebody is very keen to tell you exactly how uh, they felt, how you have offended them and what, you're gonna, what needs to be done to fix this. And what you'll see there is that you often get quite trodden over because there's very little room for you to be listened to and for your opinion to be heard. So this is quite a, quite a negative way of responding in, in conflict when you just wanna, wanna say your thing and move on and maybe don't really care necessarily about um, the feelings of the other person and maintaining that relationship. So really where, uh, where you wanna aim for ideally, although there are some situations where the others are helpful, is number four, where there is high concern for both the relationship and finding a way forward of resolving, resolving this together. It's that piece where you consider the other person's opinion. It's not about completely compromising and just going, Let, okay, let's just do this your way. It's trying to collaborate with the other person. Right at the beginning, when I was showing you the definition of conflict, I, was, I described it, or the dictionary describes it as a struggle between two people. There's often this energy in conflict, which is that struggle energy where you're really keen to try and explain how you have felt hurt or what's gone on. And the idea with this number four, this, this concern for the goals and the relationship is to try and struggle together, to try and figure it out. And that doesn't mean it will look really seamless and really beautiful. It often looks quite clunky and all over the place because it's conflict and it's hard and it is often quite messy. So I want to show you a couple of ways that you can do that. And by the way, if you've got questions as you're going through, please drop them in the chat. I'm very happy to answer them. So one of the, the best things you can do when you are in conflict, but also the hardest, and I'm speaking to myself here as well, is to listen, to take space, to actually try and hear what the other person has to say. And the reason that's tricky, as I said at the beginning, is because you have your own voice, your own frustration, banging really loudly in your own head. All of the, the things that you would like to say become quite loud. And actually your ability to listen to the other person slightly decreases. And you might even find yourself rehearsing what you would like to say as the other person is, is speaking to you, which definitely limits your ability to listen. Even if you think you're a good multitasker, you can think and, and listen at the same time. It will be much lower, especially in conflict when your heart is, is beating that, that much quicker. So one of the key things to do, which really demonstrates your, your desire to listen and your desire to try and find um, curiosity, some clarity from the conversation, is to ask questions, to try and find a way of actually saying, do you know what, I want to hear what you have to say. 
And one of the best questions, which applies to quite a lot of different tricky conversations, challenging conversations pieces, is what is your understanding of the situation? What do you understand happened? What do you think happened from your perspective? Not in a pointed way, not because you can then, you can then uh, refute everything they've said in your comeback, but as a way of genuinely trying to understand what do you, what do you think happened? What, what did you see from your perspective? And it's that piece, as I said, of we often enter a conversation with a, with a certainty of what we think happened, but it's trying to move to this place of curiosity of trying to, to gain a bit of clarity of what they thought as well. Um, yeah, and I think James, what you've said there is great addition to this. It's difficult to be present when you have a lot on your mind. And there's some really practical things I wanna try and, try and sneak in and show you as well near the end of how to try and be present, how to take that breath, to try and take that step so you can actually hear. The next thing, once you've asked that question, when you've maybe said something around, you know, what's important to you here or what was your understanding of this situation, is to try and choose to listen to the useful information. And the reason I've worded it, worded it like that is what you might find, especially in a conversation which is a little bit more clunky and there's more, there's kind of a bit more heat to it, is often what you're given isn't useful information. It's, it's sometimes peppered in defensive language or maybe even attacking language, which is saying, well, you did this and you, I, you know, I wanted you to do this, but instead you did something else. So your job, excuse me, if you're listening well, is to try and pick apart or find the useful information in what they're saying. And to do that, it's, it's not just listening to how they're saying it because we get quite hung up or not hung up, but we become very aware of somebody's tone when they're speaking to us. If they're sounding, there's a kind of hint of frustration in their voice. Maybe we're very aware of how they're saying, but we don't take into account as much what they're saying and why they might be saying it as well. Because the truth is in conflict, what we're actually trying to communicate often is something that we value or something that we need, which we don't feel we've got. So it's worth trying to listen for that in conversation. And one of the best things you can do is just be silent and give people room to speak. If you think about some of those conversations you've had where you felt really frustrated, it might actually be because you haven't felt well listened to the other person. They've been speaking back over you or you know, you haven't really finished speaking and they're just trying to get their point in again. So we have this innate, um, this innate, uh, what's the word, kind of desire as human beings to feel heard and to feel understood. So if you can try and do that when you're speaking to people in conflict, then you're, you're really onto something good in, in terms of, of actually trying to help move the conversation forward. Ooh, very nice. Ronan, can you just, are you able to unmute yourself and just explain what you've put in the chat? I'm intrigued by your quote here. Um, uh, people who didn't see it, it's you, you can't misquote silence. Um, I, uh, in some ways, it's a defensive um, mechanism because, you know, if somebody then says, well, what you said was or what you meant was, um, you can't be misquoted. You know, mm -hmm. you know, the way sometimes people recall something similar to what you said or else you're sure you said one thing. Uh, and then you start doubting, did I phrase it that way? So it's just, and I, I don't mean it in the sense of like shutting down and refusing mm. to engage, but you know, you, you can use it as a thing of um, taking a beat or taking mm. several beats, depending mm. on, on the need, you know, that if, if you know what I mean. Mm. So good, thank you so much. And you've got some, some love in the chat for your contribution there as well. I think that's true. You can't you can't misquote silence. It can't be misconstrued. It is what it is. You're just listening and taking that second. So brilliant contribution. Thank you. Unless you've particularly expressive eyebrows, that's a great <laughs> way of making a point. Um, Do you know what? You're really correct. It's something I was going to come to later, but it's um, <laughs> body language, right? Our body language. I said earlier on, you can only see certain amounts of us when we're on the screen but you can see somebody's facial expressions and it, it can be very telling what somebody, how well somebody's listening. I've, I've definitely had conversations with people 
in a virtual setting where they're kind of looking away from the screen in a different direction, only half listening to what you're saying. And that is frustrating. You're only going to rile somebody up even more if you're not really engaging with them. And as Rona said, anything to do with kind of um, facial expressions, so raising eyebrows, rolling your eyes as somebody speaking. I'm sure none of you have ever done that before, but, um, but it's definitely one, one to avoid. Um, so the, the, other, the other piece to this is trying to decipher the, uh, try to pull apart or work out where, where you are hearing attack and actually what's behind that attack. So we tend to go into a conversation expecting to receive attack. We're expecting to receive somebody, expecting to hear somebody say something, them uh, speaking ill of us or not being very kind in what they're saying. And if we go in expecting that, then that does frame our experience and what we pick up on. So it's worth, and I know this is easier said than done, trying to assume the best intent from the person that's speaking to us. What are they actually trying to say? Especially if it's a relationship, which there's, um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a very valuable relationship to both of you, then trying to, to hear well what the other person might be saying, even if they're kind of fluffing up their words and it's not really coming across well. Don't jump at them for that. Try and work out what's being said behind, behind that language. Otherwise, you're likely to try and give attack back and you just get locked in this cycle of it going round and round. I'm sure all of us have experienced that. It's not pleasant. It's really hard to get out of and to move forward in as well. So the next thing I want to look at, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. Here we go. Is some, some words to avoid. So there is certain language that is like literally pouring gasoline in a conversation and just watching it go up in flames. And they are incredibly hard to avoid, to not say when you're feeling really frustrated. So one of the key ones that's often used, you might, if you, um, you have a partner or a very close friend, you might realize that you've used many of these many times before is you always, or you never, or sometimes. So these phrases, which are speaking in absolutes are quite unhelpful because they're not specific. So if you're saying to somebody, um, can only think of spouse related ones for now. Again, totally hypothetical. Uh, you never take out the bins. The reason that's really hard to actually come back at is because it's so unspecific. It just sounds like a complete assault or an attack on everything, everything they've ever done in this area. And it's really hard for them to say, well, actually, you know, one time I, I did do them or I do it every other week. It, it creates this quite tricky dynamic for somebody to work, work for. The same in a work context. If you have somebody you work with who's often late to things, and uh, maybe they're late to a meeting quite regularly, if you say you're always late to these meetings, what you'll find is probably that they either feel quite attacked or they don't really know what to say back to that. So there's a piece around, around trying to make sure your language is helpful. Those beginnings of the sentences are actually easy, not, not necessarily easy for somebody to digest, but are more specific. They give a context or a time uh, in, in your suggestion or in your, um, uh, in your report of what you think that has been done. And things like you made me feel are not particularly helpful. So a phrase instead you could use is, I felt X, I felt sad when, when this didn't happen or when I didn't, didn't um, receive that, uh, you know, maybe receive the emails are quite a weird one to feel sad about. I first felt frustrated when I didn't receive the email as I'd asked you quite a few times across the last week. The last one I've got on here is I'm sorry if, and what I mean by that is when people say, I'm sorry if that offended you, I'm sorry if I upset you. If somebody's just said to you, I felt really upset, you're actually minimizing and slightly neglecting what they say. If your comeback is, I'm sorry if that offended you, they've actually just given that to you. So it's trying, it's worth acknowledging that. And where you can, if it feels right, apologizing for that, or at least saying, I hear you've just said you actually felt quite upset when, when I did this or when this happened. So it's worth doing a couple of things, it, being specific with time and context. So if you do have a colleague who is often late, instead of you, you are always late to these meetings or you never turn up on time, it might be um, on Monday last week and on Friday of the week before, I, just, I noticed that you turned up five minutes late to that meeting. And I wonder if you could be on time because as a company, we want to give off quite, a, we want to give off a good reputation to our stakeholders when we are having those meetings. So it's trying to, trying to piece together, give a structure to that, which actually somebody can go, oh yeah, do you know what? I do remember being late on Monday and Friday and I can hear now, not just how you felt, but why you felt, why you felt that frustration. 
because it's a very good phrase to use the word because because as a company you know we really want to value our stakeholders and turn up on time to things i'm just going to jump to the chat because i can see a few things coming in here um you can't agree with someone if they say i feel is that a question uh, you can't argue with some thoughts. Sorry, I read that wrong. Yes, you're right. So the, the lang a language piece to use there is around um, the chain of making sure you use the pronoun I as much as you can. How did you feel? Not just you made me feel, but I felt X. It, you can't argue with somebody. Uh, um, Elena, you're completely right. You can, but it, it's, you have a lot less grounds to argue with somebody if they're actually just um, communicating how they have felt for a certain situation. Uh, yes, April, let me come to that. So can you explain the sometimes phrase? So the sometimes, let me just jump back to the slide so everyone else can see as well. So sometimes is a slightly, um, a slightly less uh, explicit or absolute version of you always or you never, but it also falls into that category of not being very explicit, of not really giving much detail. So saying uh, you sometimes, um, I've noticed you sometimes don't, check your emails before you send them. If there's actually a specific thing you can point somebody towards, if there's a colleague who's often just making a lot of typos and emails, then saying, giving them an example, in this email you sent last week, I noticed there are quite a few typos. So it just enables somebody, you'd have a, a, a valuable conversation where you can slightly move forward from that. Um, great. All right, so, um, so I'm just seeing the, Anything else in the chat for now? No. If there's any questions I missed off as we're going through, because it's quite hard to keep control of the chat and the slides and, and look at your wonderful faces, then do let me know and I'll come to them at the end. So one of the, one of the tools to point you towards is uh, how you can put your own thoughts together. And I think somebody was actually leading us towards this in the chat just then, of helping somebody, once you've listened, once you've asked questions, and once you've um, given them space to really explain what they're thinking or feeling, then comes your chance to say, okay, this from my perspective is, is what happened. So this is a great model. It's saying what you saw, what you see, what you felt and what you need. And it's a really simple one. I'll give you an example in a second. So the first is around what did you observe? And where this is different from evaluating is it's been quite factual. It's just saying, as I said earlier, um, you know, if, there's, if there is a colleague who's often making loads of mistakes in emails or their work is a little bit sloppy. Giving a very specific example, um, in this spreadsheet last week, there were some really key details that I felt were missing that didn't capture the data that we needed. Giving some quite factual things rather than you're really lazy when you're putting, putting together spreadsheets, which is an evaluation of that person's character and much harder to try and come back on. Just saying what you saw, what are some facts you can give that person which aren't something necessarily that can be argued back on. They might want to justify themselves, but they're often quite clear as day what you saw. How you felt is important because I think it's something we find really hard to do sometimes. But as, um, as somebody mentioned in the chat, when we're basing it, when we're framing it and explaining from our own perspective of how I felt, I think there's something quite valuable. It's quite vulnerable as well, depending on the person that's in front of you of not just saying what you saw, but how that affected you. And they, they might have done it themselves and they're part of the conversation, which makes it a bit easier. But it's with that, making sure it's the language of what I felt rather than how you made me feel. So uh, I noticed a few details missing from that spreadsheet that were really important. I felt quite frustrated. And then the last part is what did you need? What do you need or what would you have liked? So this flips right back to the beginning of what we were saying of of explaining to somebody, what would you have liked to have happened? What's the, the kind of thing that you were hoping for, which didn't, didn't end up being achieved for whatever reason? I would have liked for, for those details to be filled in just so we have a really full picture of um, whatever data it is that you were trying to get hold of. So just giving that other side of the coin as well, this is what I would have liked to have seen. And maybe you even then add to that, if, if you're at this point in a conversation and say, uh, next time, I'd just love if you could take a couple more minutes just to check back over your work and, um, and make sure that some of those details are there. Now, as I'm saying this, I'm aware that all of this is very dependent on particular relationships. There'll be some people that you work with, particularly if you line manage people or if, you're, if you lead a company, where you probably have that scope to give that specific feedback and to be quite, uh, quite deliberate about how you're going through that. 
If you have people who are your equal, who are on the same sort of level as you, so if you're a co-founder of a company and there's, there's been some discrepancy or dispute with another co-founder, it can be quite hard to have these conversations or harder to have them because there's not necessarily that, um, there might not be that structure in place where you're then they're likely to often receive feedback from you. So it does, does depend on, um, on the person. So that's a quick structure piece. And it's worth mentioning as we come to the last few minutes of just thinking about what makes up communication. So we spend a lot of time talking about the text that you might say, the, the language that you might use. But actually, if you think about what makes up communication, and, and this is taken from a study by Albert Morabian, he says that that 7% of what you're communicating is the text, the language that you're using, 55%, so it's pretty huge, is down to the, the uh, your, what you're doing with your posture, what you're doing with your eye contact, your facial expressions. And then the final 38% is through the tonality in your voice. So I wanna teach you something super quickly. I'm gonna stop sharing the slides for a moment. Ooh, how do I do that? Um, how do I get off that? Oh no, <laughs> an absolute rookie, here we go. Um, stop there, great. Um, and just teach you something really quickly, which just gets you thinking slightly about your body language as well. So I'm just aware as I'm looking around, I can see maybe two, four, six, six people who've got their cameras on and the rest of you don't. You're welcome to put your camera on if you would like, otherwise feel free to keep it off. But we all have slightly different postures, either when we're listening to people speak or when we're speaking ourselves. It's worth just noting for a second, what do you naturally do? What's your kind of natural posture that you sit in? maybe especially when you're in a slightly more tricky conversation as well. We tend to slouch. If, you're in a, if you've got a desk in front of you, then you probably have your, your elbows or your arms on the desk at the moment, which tends to mean your shoulders are slightly rolled forward. You lose a little bit of space in your chest as well. There's a quick exercise I wanna show you. You're welcome to have a go at doing this as well, which is called the string. I often get people to stand up as they do this, but I'm not gonna make you do that. I love how some people have shifted their body language already in like the last few seconds. I sit perfectly all the time. So this, this is just getting you to sit up straight, take a bit more space, make sure that your spine is actually not kind of curled or crunched over. So if you could just make sure that you're not sat on the, to the back of your seat, you kind of shuffle forward slightly. So you're near the front of your, your chair. So just wiggle your bum forward and then make sure that your feet are flat on the ground. So some of you will probably sit with your knees, your legs crossed over one another. But just plant your feet flat on the ground for a sec. And then imagine that you've got a piece of string which is looped all the way through the middle of your torso. It comes up through the back of your neck and then out through the top of your head. So it's like a nice long piece of string. And then if you're feeling brave, you can copy me doing this. I want you to bring your arm above your head and imagine you're having to pull up that piece of string. Give it a go, you all look ridiculous together. So imagine pulling that piece of string, give it a tug. And as you do so, see if you can sit up slightly taller and then just bring your arm back down to your side again. If you're off camera, I'm just trusting you're having a go and not, not letting us all look ridiculous on camera here. It's great. So if you look around, my gosh, okay. So if you look at the people who have their cameras on, you will see a slight change in their posture. So Ola is suddenly just sat up incredibly tall. You can see this length in, in her neck as she's sitting there. Sorry to call you out, Ola. If you're looking at ever as well, it's suddenly that the shoulders are quite flat on the frame, slightly rolled back. It's just that sense of taking up slightly more space. And what you'll notice as well is you'll suddenly have a little bit more room in your chest to breathe when you're actually sitting up properly. This might be something to come back to. It's a bit of muscle memory. It's really hard to do because naturally your body will try and go back to your normal, slightly slouched over position. But the reason I bring this up is because in conflict, when you feel that rush of adrenaline, or you're having that tricky conversation with somebody, you'll notice that your natural instinct is sometimes to take up slightly less space because maybe you're feeling nervous and our bodies tend to clench up and get a little, we get a bit cranky when we're feeling nervous. So it's worth taking a second, just sitting up properly, taking a few breaths so that you actually steady your breathing and give yourself some oxygen as you go into that conversation. And you'll find that you feel a lot more comfortable. Maybe at first you won't. A lot of people say to me, I feel really exposed sitting like this. It feels really tall and they're kind of a bit out of the ordinary. So it does take a little bit of practice, but over, over time, you will start to feel that bit more confident. All right, so we've got like, 
two minutes left because I've got to jump to another training and not not too not too um few moments time but if you have any questions just as we come to land I'd love to hear them I'd love to try and answer them in two minutes and if you've got any questions that we don't get to answer feel free to to find me on LinkedIn or um grab my email address off of Angie and I, I'm happy to to answer any questions over over via email or LinkedIn and